This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Solomon's Mines by H. Ryder Haggard Chapter 13 The Attack Slowly, and without the slightest appearance of haste or excitement, the three columns crept on. When within about five hundred yards of us, the main or center column halted at the root of a tongue of open plain which ran up into the hill, to give time to the other divisions to circumvent our position, which was shaped more or less in the form of a horseshoe, with its two points facing towards the town of Lou. The object of this maneuver was that the threefold assault should be delivered simultaneously. "'Oh, for a Gatling!' groaned Good, as he contemplated the serried phalanxes beneath us. "'I would clear that plane in twenty minutes.' "'We have not got one, so it is no use yearning for it. "'But suppose you try a shot, Quartermain,' said Sir Henry. "'See how near you can go to that tall fellow who appears to be in command. Two to one you miss him, and an even sovereign to be honestly paid if we ever get out of this, "'that you don't drop that bullet within five yards.' "'This piqued me, so loading the express with solid ball.' I waited till my friend walked some ten yards out from his force, in order to get a better view of our position, accompanied only by an orderly. Then, lying down and resting the express on a rock, I covered him. The rifle, like all expresses, was only sighted to 350 yards, so to allow for the drop in trajectory I took him halfway down the neck, which ought I calculated to find him in the chest. He stood quite still and gave me every opportunity, but whether it was the excitement or the wind or the fact of the man being a long shot, I don't know, but this was what happened. Getting dead on, as I thought, a fine sight, I pressed, and when the puff of smoke had cleared away, to my disgust, I saw my man standing there unharmed, whilst his orderly, who was at least three paces to the left, was stretched upon the ground, apparently dead. Turning swiftly, the officer I had aimed at began to run towards his men in evident alarm. "'Bravo, Quartermain!' sang out Good. "'You frightened him!' This made me very angry, for, if possible to avoid it, I hate to miss in public. When a man is master of only one art, he likes to keep up his reputation in that art. Moved quite out of myself at my failure, I did a rash thing. Rapidly covering the general as he ran, I let drive with the second barrel. Instantly the poor man threw up his arms and fell forward onto his face. This time I had made no mistake, and I say it as a proof of how little we think of others when our own safety, pride, or reputation is in question, I was brute enough to feel delighted at the sight. The regiments who had seen the feat cheered wildly at this exhibition of the white man's magic, which they took as an omen of success, while the force the general had belonged to, which indeed, as we ascertained afterwards, he had commanded, fell back in confusion. Sir Henry and Good now took up their rifles and began to fire the latter industrially browning the dense mass before him with another Winchester repeater, and I also had another shot or two, with the result, so far as we could judge, that we put some six or eight men hors de combat before they were out of range. Just as we stopped firing, there came an ominous roar from our far right. Then a similar roar rose on our left, the other two divisions were engaging us. At the sound, the mass of men before us opened out a little and advanced towards the hill and up the spit of bare grassland at a slow trot, singing a deep-throated song as they ran. We kept up a steady fire from our rifles as they came, Ignosi 
joining in occasionally, and accounted for several men. But, of course, we produced no more effect upon that mighty rush of armed humanity than he who throws pebbles does on the breaking wave. On they came, with a shout and the clashing of spears. Now they were driving in the pickets we had placed among the rocks at the foot of the hill. After that the advance was a little slower, for though as yet we had offered no serious opposition, the attacking forces must climb uphill, and they came slowly to save their breath. Our first line of defense was about halfway down the side of the slope, our second fifty yards further back, while our third occupied the edge of the plateau. On they stormed, shouting their war cry, Twala, Twala, Chile, Chile, Twala, Twala, smite, smite. Ignosi, Ignosi, Chile, Chile, answered our people. They were quite close now, and the Twalas, or throwing knives, began to flash backwards and forwards, and now with an awful yell the battle closed in. To and fro swayed the mass of struggling warriors, men falling fast as leaves in an autumn wind. But before long the superior weight of the attacking forces began to tell, and our first line of defense was slowly pressed back till it merged into the second. Here the struggle was very fierce, but again our people were driven back and up, till at length, within twenty minutes of the commencement of the fight, our third line came into action. But by this time the assailants were very much exhausted, and besides had lost many men killed and wounded, and to break through that third impenetrable hedge of spears proved beyond their powers. For a while the seething lines of savages swung backwards and forwards in the fierce ebb and flow of battle, and the issue was doubtful. Sir Henry watched the desperate struggle with a kindling eye, and then without a word he rushed off, followed by Good, and flung himself into the hottest of the fray. As for myself, I stopped where I was. The soldiers caught sight of his tall form as he plunged into battle, and there rose a cry of Nanzia Inkubu, Nanzia Unkungo Glovo. Here is the elephant. Chile, Chile. From that moment the end was no longer in doubt. Inch by inch, fighting with splendid gallantry, the attacking force was pressed back down the hillside, till at last it retreated upon its reserves in something like confusion. At that instant, too, a messenger arrived to say that the left attack had been repulsed, and I was just beginning to congratulate myself, believing that the affair was over for the present, when, to our horror, we perceived our men who had been engaged in the right defense being driven towards us across the plain, followed by swarms of the enemy who had evidently succeeded at this point. Ignosi, who was standing by me, took in the situation at a glance and issued a rapid order. Instantly the reserve regiment around us, the Greys, extended itself. Again Ignosi gave a word of command, which was taken up and repeated by the captains, and in another second, to my intense disgust, I found myself involved in a furious onslaught upon the advancing foe. Getting as much as I could behind Ignosi's huge frame, I made the best of a bad job, and toddled along to be killed as though I liked it. In a minute or two, we were plunging through the flying groups of our men, who at once began to reform behind us, and then I am sure I do not know what happened. All I can remember is a dreadful rolling noise of the meeting of shields and the sudden apparition of a huge ruffian whose eyes seemed literally to be staring out of his head, making straight at me with a bloody spear. But, I say it with pride, I rose, or rather sank, to the occasion. It was one before which most people would have collapsed once and for all. Seeing that if I stood where I was I must be killed, as the horrid apparition came I flung myself down in front of him, so cleverly that, being unable to stop himself, he took a header right over my prostrate form. 
Before he could rise again, I had risen and settled the matter from behind with my revolver. Shortly after this, somebody knocked me down, and I remember no more of that charge. When I came to, I found myself back at the copy, with Good bending over me holding some water and a gourd. "'How do you feel, old fellow?' he asked anxiously. I got up and shook myself before replying. "'Pretty well, thank you,' I answered." "'Thank heavens! When I saw them carry you in, I felt quite sick. "'I thought you were done for.' "'Not this time, my boy. "'I fancy I only got a rap on the head, which knocked me stupid. "'How has it ended?' "'They are repulsed at every point for a while. "'The loss is dreadfully heavy. "'We have quite two thousand killed and wounded, "'and they must have lost three. "'Look, there's a sight.' and he pointed to the long lines of men advancing by fours. In the center of every group of four, and being borne by it, was a kind of hide tray, of which a Kukuana force always carries a quantity, with a loop for a handle at each end. On these trays, and their number seemed endless, lay wounded men, who as they arrived were hastily examined by the medicine men, of whom ten were attached to a regiment. If the wound was not of a fatal character, the sufferer was taken away and attended to as carefully as circumstances would allow. But if, on the other hand, the injured man's condition proved hopeless, what followed was very dreadful, though doubtless it may have been the truest mercy. One of the doctors, under pretense of carrying out an examination, "'swiftly opened an artery with a sharp knife, "'and in a minute or two the sufferer expired painlessly. "'There were many cases that day in which this was done. "'In fact, it was done in the majority of cases "'when the wound was in the body, "'for the gash made by the entry of the enormously broad spears "'used by the Kukuanas "'generally rendered recovery impossible.' In most instances the poor sufferers were already unconscious, and in others the fatal nick of the artery was inflicted so swiftly and painlessly that they did not seem to notice it. Still, it was a ghastly sight, and one from which we were glad to escape. Indeed, I never remember anything of the kind that affected me more than seeing these gallant soldiers thus put out of pain by the red-handed medicine men. Except, indeed, on one occasion when, after an attack, I saw a force of Swazis burying their hopelessly wounded alive. Hurrying from this dreadful scene to the further side of the copy, we found Sir Henry, who still held a battle-axe in his hand, Ignosi, Enfadus, and one or two of the chiefs in deep consultation. "'Thank heaven, here you are, Quartermain. "'I can't quite make out what Ignosi wants to do. "'It seems that though we have beaten off the attack, "'Twala is now receiving large reinforcements "'and is showing a disposition to invest us "'with the view of starving us out. "'That's awkward. "'Yes, especially as Enfadus says that the water supply has given out. "'My lord, that is so.' said Infadus, the spring cannot supply the wants of so great a multitude, and it is failing rapidly. Before night we shall all be thirsty. Listen, Macumazahn, thou art wise, and hast doubtless seen many wars in the lands from whence thou camest, that is, if indeed they make wars in the stars. Now tell us, what shall we do? Twala has brought up many fresh men to take the place of those who have fallen. Yet Twala has learnt his lesson. The hawk did not think to find the heron ready, but our beak has pierced his breast. He fears to strike at us again. We, too, are wounded, and he will wait for us to die. He will wind himself round us like a snake round a buck, and fight the fight of sit-down. I hear thee, I said. So, Macumazahn, thou seest we have no water here, and but a little food, 
and we must choose between these three things, to languish like a starving lion in his den, or to strive to break away towards the north, or, and here he rose and pointed towards the dense mass of our foes, to launch ourselves straight at Twala's throat. Inkibu, the great warrior, for today he fought like a buffalo in a net, and Twala's soldiers went down before his axe like young corn before the hail, and with these eyes I saw it. Inkibu says charge, but the elephant is ever prone to charge. Now what says Macumazan, the wily old fox, who has seen much, and loves to bite his enemy from behind. The last word is in Ignosi, the king, for it is a king's right to speak of war. But let us hear thy voice, O Macumazan, who watches by night, and the voice, too, of him of the transparent eye. What sayest thou, Ignosi? I asked. Nay, my father, answered our quondam servant, who now, clad as he was in the full panoply of savage war, looked every inch a warrior king. Do thou speak, and let me, who am but a child in wisdom besides thee, hearken to thy words. Thus adjured, after taking hasty counsel with Good and Sir Henry, I delivered my opinion briefly to the effect that, being trapped, our best chance especially in view of the failure of our water supply, was to initiate an attack upon Twala's forces. Then I recommended that the attack should be delivered at once, before our wounds grew stiff, and also before the sight of Twala's overpowering force caused the hearts of our soldiers to wax small like fat before a fire. Otherwise, I pointed out, some of the captains might change their minds, and making peace with Twala, desert to him, or even betray us into his hands. This expression of opinion seemed, on the whole, to be favorably received. Indeed, among the Kukuanas, my utterances met with a respect which has never been accorded to them before or since. But the real decision as to our plans lay with Ignosi, who, since he had been recognized as rightful king, could exercise the almost unbounded rights of sovereignty, including, of course, the final decision on matters of generalship, and it was to him that all eyes were now turned. At length, after a pause, during which he appeared to be thinking deeply, he spoke. Inkibu, Makumazan, and Buguan, brave white men, and my friends, Infadus, my uncle, and chiefs. My heart is fixed. I will strike at Twala this day, and set my fortunes on the blow, I and my life, my life and your lives also. Listen, thus will I strike. Ye see how the hill curves round like the half-moon, and how the plain runs like a green tongue towards us within the curve. We see, I answered. Good. It is now midday, and the men eat and rest after the toil of battle. When the sun has turned and traveled a little way towards the darkness, let thy regiment, my uncle, advance with one other down to the great tongue, and it shall be that when Twala sees it, he will hurl his force against it to crush it. But the spot is narrow, and the regiments can come against thee one at a time only. So may they be destroyed one by one, and the eyes of all Twala's army shall be fixed upon a struggle the like of which has not been seen by living man. And with thee, my uncle, shall go Inkerbu, my friend, that when Twala sees his battle-axe flashing in the first rank of the greys, his heart may grow faint. And I will come with the second regiment, that which follows thee, so that if ye are destroyed as it might happen, there may yet be a king left to fight for, and with me shall come Macumazan the wise. It is well, O king, said Infadus, apparently contemplating the certainty of the complete annihilation of his regiment with perfect calmness. 
Truly, these Kukuanas are a wonderful people. Death has no terror for them when it is incurred in the course of duty. And whilst the eyes of the magnitude of Twala's soldiers are thus fixed upon the fight, went on Ignosi, behold, one-third of the men who are left alive to us, that is, about six thousand, shall creep along the right horn of the hill, and fall upon the left flank of Twala's forces, and one-third shall creep along the left horn, and fall upon Twala's right flank. And when I see that the horns are ready to toss Twala, then will I, with the men who remain to me, charge home in Twala's face, and if fortune goes with us, the day will be ours, and before night drives her black oxen from the mountains to the mountains, we shall sit in peace at Loo. And now let us eat and make ready, and in Fadus do thou prepare, that the plan be carried out without fail, and stay, let my white father, Buguan, go with the right horn, that his shining eye may give courage to the captains. The arrangements for attack thus briefly indicated were set in motion with a rapidity that spoke well for the perfection of the Kukuwana military system. Within little more than an hour, rations had been served out and devoured. The divisions were formed, the scheme of onslaught was explained to the leaders, and the whole force, numbering about 18,000 men, was ready to move, with the exception of a guard left in charge of the wounded. Presently Good came up to Sir Henry and myself. "'Good-bye, you fellows,' he said. "'I am off with the right wing, according to orders. "'And so I have come to shake hands in case we should not meet again, you know,' he added significantly. "'We shook hands in silence.' and not without the exhibition of as much emotion as Anglo-Saxons are wont to show. "'It is a queer business,' said Sir Henry, his deep voice shaking a little. "'And I confess I never expect to see tomorrow's sun. "'So far as I can make out the greys with whom I am to go, "'are to fight until they are wiped out, "'in order to enable the wings to slip around unawares and outflank Twala.' Well, so be it. At any rate, it will be a man's death. Goodbye, old fellow. God bless you. I hope you will pull through and live to collar the diamonds. But if you do, take my advice and don't have anything more to do with pretenders. In another second, Good had wrung us both by the hand and gone. And then Infadus came up and led off Sir Henry to his place in the forefront of the greys whilst with many misgivings I departed with Ignosi to my station in the 2nd Attacking Regiment. End of chapter 13